All right, we are venturing into the wonderful world of equilibrium, and we'll spend some time here this semester. But first up, we know that many reactions are reversible, meaning they can go forward and backwards. And so eventually we end up with a mixture of reactants and products that they eventually end up in a state of chemical equilibrium, a dynamic equilibrium. And when we say that, we're talking about the rate of the forward and reverse reactions being equal, not so much the amounts. A reaction can hit chemical equilibrium when 99% of the reactants have been converted to products, or maybe 9%. We're not talking about a 50-50 split here. All right, and if you remember, we talked about a dynamic equilibrium with a saturated solution. So even though macroscopically we don't see a change, microscopically at the particle level, things are still happening. Products are still forming, and products are breaking down into reactants. So when we look at an example of a chemical equilibrium, here we have a reaction that we'll look at several times here today. But if I take one mole of carbon monoxide and three moles of hydrogen, place it in a 10 liter flask at 1200 Kelvin, I can see a couple graphs here. Initially, I have a lot of reactants and no products. So when I look at moles versus time, for this specific reaction, three moles of hydrogen, one mole of carbon monoxide, and no products to start. So of course, as time goes on, the moles of hydrogen and moles of carbon monoxide go, get lower, and then my moles of product increases, and eventually we flatline, and that's where we see equilibrium occurring. As far as the rate is concerned, again, the forward rate dominates at the start. There is no reverse rate because we don't have any products to break apart, but eventually the rates become equal, they flatline, we've hit equilibrium when the rates are equal. So how does this look mathematically? Well first, here's a, my reaction and the same information that was given to me. But I say at equilibrium, I cool the vessel down and I get 0.387 moles of water to come out. So I want to know what is the molar composition of the equilibrium mixture. And so what I'm going to do is set up an ice table. And we're going to use this a lot with equilibriums initial change and equilibrium. So initially I have one mole of carbon monoxide, three moles of hydrogen, and no moles of my products. The change is going to follow the balanced equation because when this reaction happens, whether it be at the particle level or at the mole level or anywhere in between, we've got one to three to one to one as far as the reactant, reacting ratio. So I say, change-wise, I'm going to lose reactants. And based on the coefficients, I'm going to say it's going to change minus x for the carbon monoxide, minus 3x for the hydrogen. My, react my products are going to increase. They're both a coefficient of 1, so they are plus x. So what I say at equilibrium, my carbon monoxide is 1 minus x. My hydrogen is 3 minus 3x, three and my methane is x. Well, so is water. Water is x, but it told me 0.387 moles of water. So because of that piece of information, I now know x. I can come back here, and I can plug and chug, and now I know the molar composition of this equilibrium. 0.613 moles of carbon monoxide. 1.839 moles of hydrogen, and the 0.387 of my products. The answer should make sense. My reactant moles went down, my product moles went up, and initially, from my balanced equation, I would start with four moles, I'm going to end up with two, and the equilibrium is in between that, it's an intermediate, and when I add these numbers up, it's 3.226 moles. So the answer makes sense. Now, if I look at my previous example, and that's the data we just obtained, I run a second experiment, but this time I start with two moles of carbon monoxide and three moles of hydrogen, I get a different equilibrium molar composition. So what can I conclude from this? Well, our equilibrium composition does indeed depend on the amount of starting substances. 
those graphs we just looked at were very specific to three moles of carbon monoxide and one mole of hydrogen. But it makes sense that our equilibrium occurs kind of at the same spot. And this is true, so we will find that the compositions at the same temperature are related by this equilibrium constant that we're going to see. So let's look at that. So our first equilibrium constant we'll look at, Kc, takes on this generic form if given this generic reaction. And what you'll notice is that the products are on top, reactants are on the bottom, and the coefficients of the balanced reaction end up as our exponents. So my equilibrium constant for the reaction we were just looking at, the concentration of methane times the concentration of water vapor divided by the concentration of carbon monoxide times the concentration of hydrogen cubed because of the fact that we have a 3 in the balanced equation. Now we'll note right now that only gases are in our Kc expression. Liquid and solid concentrations are constant, so they're not going to be in these expressions. So let's look at a couple examples. Here's our ammonia production equation. So my Kc is the concentration of ammonia squared and then on the bottom concentration of nitrogen concentration of hydrogen cubed. Now this is a homogeneous equilibria because everything is in the gaseous phase. Everything is in the same phase. And most of the ones we look at here will be like that. We can have fractions. So here's another example of that ammonia reaction but with fractions as coefficients. So I would just use the fractions in the equilibrium expression. And then here is a heterogeneous equilibria. And again, we're not including the solids. So the iron and the iron oxide is not going to be part of the expression. So I will just compare the concentration of hydrogen to the fourth power to the concentration of water to the fourth power. Now this equilibrium constant we're looking at is Kc because we're defining the equilibrium in terms of molar concentration, molarity, as we'll see here. And this law of mass action shows up in the AP uh, curricula, so I just wanted to talk to you about it, but it's just what we were mentioning, that the value of Kc for a reaction are going to be the same if the reaction is run at a given temperature no matter what the concentrations are that we'll plug in. So no matter what we start with, we're going to get the same Kc. Let's see that. So this was my data from the previous slide. Experiment 1, experiment 2. Alright, so this is my Kc expression. And if I plug the right numbers in, I'm going to get the same answer. Now be careful. Kc means concentration, so I need molarity. The data was given to me in moles, but the problem said that this was in a 10 liter vessel. So my molarities will be the moles divided by 10. So when I plug in that data, this is what I end up with. Okay, so my moles of products 0.387 become 0 0.0387 as far as the concentrations are concerned. 0 0.613 is 0 0.0613, so on and so forth. But when I plug and chug and calculate, I'll notice that my constants are pretty darn the same. 3.93, 3.91, so I'm going to say my average is 3.92. And I'll also notice that the reverse reaction, if I start with carbon, I'm sorry, start with methane and water, I'll end up getting the same Kc when run at the same temperature. And you can see that in the book if you want to explore that a little further. So here's a sample question. Here I have the decomposition of hydrogen iodide. So you need to make an ice table, but this time, since we're calculating Kc, I want to make sure my ice table is in molarity. So take a moment and see if you can figure out your table. Pause the video and I'll show you it. So hopefully your ice table looks like this. Four moles in a five liter vessel, so my initial concentration is point. 800 molar. Of course my products is zero. My change comes from the balanced equation and then since 
at equilibrium there were 0.442 moles of iodine 0.442 and 5 liters so that's my X and because of that I can figure out the concentration of the hydrogen iodide as well now that I know my concentrations at equilibrium I can plug into my equilibrium expression so I'll have 0 0.0884 squared on the top 0.623 squared on the bottom and none of my equilibrium constants will have a unit but here you should get 0 0.0201 now just as a little aside um, the calculating of the KC is the huge main part of this part of the notes but since we did just do kinetics and talked about rates where is this coming from so again equilibrium is when the rate of my forward reaction equals the rate of my reverse reaction of course these two rate laws are coming from experiments that's where they can only come from but if I set them equal to each other and then rearrange to have the constants on top of each other to relate them when I put the constant of my forward reaction over my constant of my reverse reaction you'll notice that this right here is KC so yes I could find KC through rate data I could run rates like we did in lab get data calculate K do it for the forward and reverse compare those calculations and get KC or I can run reactions get concentration data and do an ice table it's a lot easier that way but at least it tells you that it is connected to kinetics now since we are talking about just gases there is KP which is the equilibrium constant expression using partial pressure pressures for gases instead of molarity but that's not a big surprise because when we talked about gases the ideal gas law PV equals NRT if I rearrange that N over V moles per liter is molarity and pressure is related to that over RT R of course is the ideal gas law constant and T is a temperature and since this is all temperature dependent that would just be a constant so magically we have this relationship that our KP is equal to KC times this constant RT to the delta N and delta N is going to be the difference in my gas mole products and my gas mole reactants so let's see this in action here's that same equation if they asked me to write the KP expression it's the same thing except using partial pressures instead of concentration and you can see that now to calculate it if they didn't give you the partial pressures you can plug and chug to that equation from previous slides we found that the KC is 3.92 it was at 1200 Kelvin and my ideal gas law constant in atmospheres is 0 0.0821 there are sorry two moles of gaseous products and four moles of gaseous reactants so 2 minus 4 is negative 2 so mathematically when I plug and chug that's my KP value last thing there are many times where we add up reactions to get an overall reaction and so here when I add this reaction up I'm going to get rid of the methane I've got three hydrogens over here so I can get rid of all but one there and that's my overall reaction well to get the K either KC or KP doesn't matter for the overall reaction I multiply the products of the K's so here the KC's were given the overall KC is going to be the multiplication of those two this might happen like when we did Hess's law we had a reaction that wasn't quite able to measure directly the Delta H so we had to measure it indirectly by adding up some reactions so that might be a reason to do this is when I can't get the KC directly from an experiment for this reaction so I have to use reaction data from two that I can. Alright, hope this helps and I'll see you soon.